Hello, third grade, and welcome to science. We're going to be working today on uh, module six, changes in ecosystems. And our first lesson will be changes affect living things. Let's go ahead and listen to our short little video clip, and then we'll jump right into our work. Hi, I'm Hero, and I want to know everything about our oceans. The ocean has amazing plants and animals. I want to learn how they live together and interact. I want to be an ocean engineer when I grow up to make sure our oceans are protected so that everyone can enjoy them. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. Now the first page, of course, you're going to go through and read where it says changes in ecosystems. Changes in ecosystems affect organisms. So changes in the environment where living things live affects those living things. Some of these changes include the temperature, food and water supply and shelter an organism needs to survive. Put an X in any of the boxes that best describe what can happen to a group of organisms when there is a forest fire. So mark the ones that you think will create, a, create an effect and then explain your thinking. How did you decide what happens to organisms if there is a forest fire? Remember to use complete sentences here. Next, we're going to jump into our next page. Look at the photo of the beaver dam. What questions do you have? Let's go ahead and take a look at that photo together. So here are two photos of a beaver dam. Take a look at them and write down any questions you have about them. Once you've completed that, you're going to read the STEM career connection about the park ranger and answer the two questions on the following page. What living things does a park ranger take care of? What does a park ranger need to know to do his or her job? And then answer the essential question to the best of your ability. How do changes in the ecosystem affect things that live there? Now, once you've completed that, we're going to jump directly into our next pages. We're going to go over our vocabulary first, and then we're going to watch a video and answer some questions. Let's go ahead and pull up our vocabulary for this lesson. So we have two sets of vocabulary words. We have pollution, what happens when harmful materials get in the water, air, or land. So whenever those things are being um, contaminated or they get dirty, we call it pollution. The population is all the members of one type of organism in an ecosystem. So if you're looking at like a forest habitat, and you're looking at the bird population, you're going to count all of the birds that live there. An ecosystem is the living and the non-living things that interact in an environment. So in an ecosystem, you're not just talking about the animals and the plants, you're also looking at the rocks and the soil and all these things and how they relate to each other. Next, we have the word migrate. Migrate means uh, when an organism moves from one place to another. Next, we have the word organism, which is any living thing. The word accommodation is an individual organism's response to a change in the ecosystem. So how is it changing with that, because of that change? A food chain is a model of the order in which living things get the food they need. So uh, plants will, in order for a plant to make food, our food chain starts with the sun. The sun gives energy to the plants. Uh, the plant converts that solar energy in a process called photosynthesis, where the plant makes food for itself. And then maybe uh, a rabbit eats that plant, and then a hawk eats that rabbit. And it's just kind of this chain, things in order of where living things get the food and the energy they need. A food web is the overlapping food chains in an ecosystem. So how those different food chains interact with each other and overlap, that's a food web. Okay, so those were our vocabulary words. Next, we're going to watch the video called Patterns for Survival on Animals and How They Survive. We're going to answer these questions. Which population keeps the grass short in the prairie? Did you know that living things depend on their environment to survive? Let's take a look at this prairie community. Prairie dogs are one type of animal that lives here. 
prairie dogs live in a complex system of underground tunnels that they build. Prairie dogs come to the surface when they are hungry to eat grass. Prairie dogs are one type of population in a prairie. A population is made up of all the members of one kind of organism in an ecosystem. Populations in an ecosystem depend on each other. There are other types of populations in a prairie. Coyotes and eagles depend on prairie dogs for food. Burrowing owls make homes in the tunnels that prairie dogs leave behind. If anything happened to the prairie dogs, the whole community would be affected. A community is made up of all the populations in an ecosystem. What do you think would happen if a disease caused all of the prairie dogs to disappear? Well, the animals that eat prairie dogs would lose a food source, so the coyotes and eagles would have to eat something else or leave. Eventually, they might disappear from the area. Without the prairie dogs there to keep digging, their tunnels might cave in or get smaller. The burrowing owls would not be able to use them and might need to leave to find new homes. The loss of the prairie dogs could help some living things as well. The grass on the prairie would start to grow taller and thicker because the prairie dogs would not be eating it. Wild horses may join the community to feed on the grasses. Other animals, like snakes and mice, may move into the abandoned prairie dog holes. All living things rely on their environment for survival. When something in the environment changes, it can make it difficult for the living things in that community to survive but it can also help other living things. What are some ways living things are helped when the environment changes? All right, now that we have finished watching our short video, we can answer our question, which population keeps the grass on the grass short on the prairie? We, we just saw and read about the prairie dogs or heard about the prairie dogs. What would be one effect of prairie dogs disappearing? So think back about the video or you can rewind and rewatch it. Next, we're going to take a look at our textbook. We're going to read pages 78 to 81 and answer these questions. What is an ecosystem for number three? And then number four, choose one ecosystem from the reading. What are some living and non-living things in that ecosystem? All right. So let's start here on page 78. At the top of our page, it says ecology. Ecosystems. Living things depend on one another. They also depend on non-living things like sunlight. Living and non-living things interact in an environment uh, to make up an ecosystem. Earth has many different kinds of ecosystems. Some are dry land, others are underwater. Some are warm and some are cold. Some have many different kinds of organisms, while others have only a few. An ecosystem may be a pond, a swamp, or a field. It may be a meadow, a river, or an island. An ecosystem may be as small as a puddle or as big as an ocean. Different organisms live in different parts of an ecosystem. Fish live in the water. Water is their habitat or home. A cattail's habitat is along the edge of a pond. An insect's habitat may be on a cattail. Living things get food, water, and shelter from their habitats. Many different habitats make up an ecosystem. So here we have a pond ecosystem. We can see that the crane, <coughs> crane flies eat plants and algae and lay eggs in the water. Turtles climb up out of the water to warm up on the sunlight. Cattails grow well in wet soil. Animal use, uh, animals use them as food and as shelter. Pond snails slide along the bottom looking for plants and algae to eat. So you can see all of these different parts. Parts of an ecosystem. <clears throat> all ecosystems are made up of living and non-living things. Living things include plants and animals, as well as bacteria and algae. Frogs, birds, and fish are some living things in a pond. Plants such as water lilies, grasses, and cattails are also living things. Non-living things include rocks, minerals, soil, water, air, and sunlight. 
Sunlight, water, and rocks are examples of non-living things in a pond. A resource is a material that living things use to survive. Living things get resources from their ecosystems. For example, plants and animals get the air and water they need. Plants use the sunlight to make food. Animals use plants and other animals as food. The water, sunlight, and soil are non-living things in this pond ecosystem. Living. Plants, animals, bacteria, algae, non-living, rocks, minerals, soil, water, air, and sunlight. Interactions in ecosystems. The different parts of an ecosystem interact. The parts depend on one another and affect one another. Living things depend on other living things. For example, animals depend on plants for food and shelter. Squirrels depend on trees for acorns to eat and gather branches to make nests and trees. The squirrel can change and affect how trees grow. Trees and other, and other plants also give off air that animals need in order to breathe. Living things also depend on and affect non-living things in ecosystems. The grass in a meadow could not grow without air, water, sunlight, and soil. Soil is a non-living thing. It's made up of bits of rocks and humus. Humus is broken down plant and animal material. It contains nutrients and soaks up rainwater. Soil that is rich in humus holds plenty of water and nutrients that plants need. When chipmunks and rabbits dig in the ground, they break up rocks, which helps form soil. Bison and other animals in the meadow depend on grasses for food. The grasses need air, water, and sunlight to, and soil to grow. Animals, including humans, affect non-living parts of the ecosystem when they dig into the ground and when they use water. Okay, so now you're able to answer questions three and four over here. Next, we're going to go on to pages 88 to 91 and answer these two questions. Where does the first organism in most food chains get its energy? And how do other organisms in a food chain get energy? So let's go ahead and flip over to page 88. Food chains. All organisms in an ecosystem need energy from food to live and grow. Most are sources of energy for other organisms as well. They pass on energy to organisms that eat them. A food chain shows how energy passes from one organism to another in an ecosystem. The first organism in a food chain is always a producer. Producers make their own food using the energy in sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. For this reason, the energy in most food chains starts with the sun. Notice that the first thing in the food chain is the sun. The sun is followed by, by sedge grass and algae. These producers get energy from the sun and use it to make their own food. So here, the first thing in most food chains is the sun. And here we can take a look at how it moves across. Since consumers eat producers, the next organism in a food chain is always consumers. A food chain may have many consumers. In the first pond food chain, grasshoppers get energy by eating the sedge grass. Turtles get energy by eating grasshoppers. and then the bald eagles eat the turtles. In the second uh, pond food chain, the pond snails get energy by eating the algae, the sunfish eat the snails, and then the bass eat the sunfish. The snails, sunfish, and bass are all consumers. Last in the food chain are decomposers. When the eagle and bass die, bacteria get energy from the dead animals. The predators hunt other organisms for food. The organisms they hunt are prey. The bass is the prey of the eagle. Food webs. Most animals eat several kinds of food. They are part of several food chains. Several connected food chains form a food web. The diagram shows a pond food web. Trace the arrows from the largemouth bass to the heron to the bald eagle. They show that the heron and the eagle eat bass. The bass is part of more than one food chain. 
food webs show how energy passes from one organism to another in an ecosystem. They show all living things are connected and how organisms compete for food. For example, many animals eat crayfish. If snakes ate all the crayfish, the other animals might go hungry. Scientists predict how organisms affect each other. Look at what would happen if all the crane flies and a pond die. Bullfrogs and mallard ducks both eat crane flies. Without the flies, these predators may not have enough food. They might die too. So take a look at how so many of these are pointing to so many different animals. So the crayfish, we can see a lot of different animals eat the crayfish. We can see that several different animals eat the largemouth bass. We see that the bald eagle eats a variety of different animals. Same with the heron. Where does the first organism in most food chains get its energy? How do other organisms in a food chain get energy? So go ahead and answer those questions now that you've gone through it. And on page 90 and 91, we just read those. There's a model of the system called the food web. Look at the model. What does the turtle eat and what eats the turtle? So over here, take a look at the turtle. What does the turtle eat? So you can see the things that point towards the turtle are the things that the turtle eats. And the things that eat the turtle are what uh, the turtle is pointing towards those things. So we can see that the bald eagle eats the turtle, um, that water snakes will eat little turtles, but that the turtles will usually eat grasshoppers, uh, they'll eat crayfish, they'll eat pond snails and so on. Now we're going to take a look at an investigation and what happens when we change an ecosystem. So investigate how rabbits, hawks, and grass depend on each other by conducting a simulation. Answer the following questions after you've finished. How do you think the grass, rabbits, and hawks depend on each other? How does changing the number of rabbits affect the hawk population? And how might grass affected by disease affect the rabbit and hawk population? So let's go ahead and open up our investigation. So here we can see that we have rabbits, we have hawks, and we have grass. Now there's a few hawks, but there's still a good amount of rabbits. So if we keep it like this, uh, the rabbit population slowly decreases, but then it comes back up because there's so many rabbits and the hawk population stays about the same. Now here you can see that as we keep this going, our hawk population is increasing. So there's more hawks now than there was at the beginning. Now the rabbit population is still kind of stable, right around 20. Now let's see what happens uh, if you add or remove rabbits. So let's press play. And let's add a lot of rabbits. So now you can see our hawk population also increased. So we started out with three hawks, now we've got five of them. Now as the population of rabbits fluctuates, the population is decreasing in the rabbits, but more hawks are being attracted because there were so many rabbits in that area. So our hawk population is increasing. So we went from three to five to six, but as the population of rabbits went down, the hawk population went down also. Now, if something affects the grass and the fields, let's see what happens to the rabbit population and the hawk population. Now notice here, we're starting with 20 rabbits and three hawks. Let's see what happens. So let's take a look at, now what were they asking us here? They were asking specifically, uh, why, 
why might grass affected by disease affect the, rab the rabbit and hawk population? So let's start with that one. So again, we have 20 rabbits and three hawks. Let's see what happens. Now, if the grass population is diseased, that means these rabbits are dying off and the grasses are dying off. So you can see the rabbit population drop very, very quickly and the hawk population drops until it's nearly gone. So here we only have a few rabbits left. We've just got the one hawk. Okay, so now you can go ahead and answer these different questions. How do you think the grass, rabbits, and hawks depend on each other? How does changing the number of rabbits affect the hawk population? So remember when we added a whole bunch and when the, then after the population of rabbits started to drop after and what happened when the grass was diseased. Next, we're going to read pages 92 and 93 in our textbook and answer the question, what is an example of a small change to an ecosystem? And what is an example of a larger change to an ecosystem? Changes in ecosystems. Every living thing changes its ecosystem as it meets its needs. A spider spins a web to catch insects for food. A robin builds a nest for shelter. A cotton plant takes water from the soil. Organisms reproduce and grow in number. These events change an ecosystem in small ways. Other living things make bigger changes to their ecosystems. For example, bacteria, worms, and mushrooms break down leaves and dead animals. These decomposers return valuable nutrients to the soil. Later, plants can use those nutrients to grow. People change ecosystems in more, uh, more than other organisms do. Some people change, some changes such as planting trees are helpful. Others such as draining wetlands to build over them harm ecosystems. All the living things shown here are trying to secure resources that meet their needs and help them survive. But every ecosystem has a limited number of resources. As a result, things must compete for them. Competition is a struggle among living things for resources. When organisms cannot compete, they cannot get the resources they need. They may die or move to another ecosystem. Here we can see seeds blown onto bare ground. The environment changes as plants take water and nutrients. More plants grow, animals move to the environment, and they use the plants for food and shelter. In time, plants grow larger. They compete for water, space, and sunlight. Animals compete for food and water. Trees block sunlight from reaching smaller plants. These plants may die as trees grow taller or larger. Okay. Next, we're going to take a look at the investigation on environment change and how changes in the environment affect living things. And we're going to answer the questions. So our questions here are what is a living thing or how is a living thing helped by one of these changes? Number 13, which of these changes to the environment are likely to occur every year? All right, let's go ahead and open this up. Most of these trees have been cut down by people. People use the wood to make new products. Plants close to the ground now were able to get sunlight that the tree used to block. These new plants are now able to grow. Many of these trees have no limbs, and there are no grasses or shrubs growing on the ground. This is because of a forest fire. The plants that once lived here did not survive the fire. This fox lives in an area where heavy snowfall changes its environment. The fox has learned to survive in the snow when this happens. It learned to listen for prey underneath the snow. 
these wild horses are living in an area that has gotten very dry. In order to stay in that area, they had to learn to get as much water as they could from puddles that form when it rains. This bear is taking advantage of a change in its environment. Fish are migrating up the river. The bear eats as much fish as it can to build up fat. It will live off this fat when the environment changes again and it needs to live through the long winter without a lot of food. This whale migrates to a new environment when it cannot get what it needs to live where it is. It moves to an environment that meets its needs. Humans respond to changes in their environment too. When too much snow falls during a snowstorm, people use machines to move the snow out of the way. Okay, so now we can go ahead and answer these two questions. How is a living thing helped by one of these changes? So think about the bear and the fish swimming up river. Think about uh, when trees were cut down or knocked down, how the, the plants that live close to the ground were now able to get the sunlight that they needed and then they were able to grow. Those are all examples. You can go back and review them one more time. There's a lot of options to pick from. For number 13, which of the changes to the environment are likely to occur every year? So think about that as well. What's likely to happen every single year? And then we're going to go in and answer page 232. Explore how humans change environments uh, on the kinds of changes that people make and how they affect living things. Then you're going to answer the question. Does building a road affect wildlife? If it does, is the effect good or bad? Use evidence to support your answer. So here you need to not just write your own answer, you need to pull evidence from the reading or from the simulation that we're going to check out right now. This picture shows clear cutting. Clear cutting is when a company cuts down all of the trees in an area to build new products. Although the company benefits from cutting down the trees, many animals are forced to find new homes. Building new communities provides new houses, schools, grocery stores, and shopping malls. Many trees had to be cut down and animal habitats destroyed for this to happen. Building a new road is an environmental change caused by humans. Although we must build roads to travel, animals were forced to find food and shelter in a new location. Parks are a lot of fun for young children, but they do change the environment where they are built. Trees, grasses, and shrubs that provided food and shelter for animals are cut down. The animals then need to find a new place to find food and shelter. People can harm their environments by creating pollution. Pollution happens when harmful materials get into the air, land, or water. Look at the pollution in the water in this picture. This is very harmful to the organisms that live in the water. Okay, now here, stop and think about what we just heard. Does building a road affect wildlife? So does it create some kind of change in their e ecosystem? And if it does, is it good or bad? So go back and pull information from what we just listened to. All right, now that we've completed these pages, we're going to jump in to our last section. We're going to read our handout on invasive species. Living things are affected by their environment. Plants and animals adapt to better survive in their environment. They may not be able to survive as well when changes occur in their environment. Most of the plants and animals that live on the island of Hawaii are native species. They have been there for a very long time. They are adapted to their environment. Some plants and animals have been brought there from other places around the world. They are invasive species. An invasive species is an organism that is introduced into an ecosystem accidentally or on purpose by humans. 
These species do very well in the ecosystem and compete with the native species. They are harmful to the environment, economy, and sometimes even people. Scientists have observed this in action by studying invasive species of plants and animals in Hawaii. One invasive animal to Hawaii is the axis deer. They were brought to the islands of Hawaii to be hunted for recreation and for food. Just 50 years ago, there were only 10 axis deer on the island of Maui. Their numbers are now estimated to be over 12,000. This is because there are no natural predators or diseases to control them. The number of axis deer in Hawaii continue to rise. They have had devastating impacts on local agriculture. They have been the cause of the loss of over $1 million throughout the state. The deer eat many of the crops where they live. This hurts the sale of crops of vegetables, grapes, and sugar cane. They also eat native plants that native animals need to eat. This hurts the native plants and wildlife. All right. Next, we're going to get in and answer our last questions. Okay, so now that we've read through our handout on invasive species, we're going to answer page 233. Why did the axis deer population rise so quickly? So think about uh, what we said in our handout. You'll read about that in this general section right here and in the last paragraph. So these last two paragraphs will help you answer that question. What is a native species? How do the axis deer change the food web in Hawaii? What does this article tell you about bringing plants and animals to new ecosystems? So all of these questions we answered while we were reading this short passage. Go ahead and go back to your reading, find the answers. You can underline them in your handout and then go back to fill in your answers on your page. That takes us to the end of this lesson. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye.